Hello everyone, my name is Onza and welcome to my examining of the Poetic Edda. In this video, we look into the poem Riksfula, which details, as its introduction claims, the story of how Heimdall fathered the social classes. Before we start reading the individual stanzas, however, let's talk about the background of this poem. Well, the Riksfula poem is presumed to be a piece composed in honor of some king, for not only does the poem praise the nobility over all, but it also bears the telltale signs of trying to link the monarch, whom it was composed in honor of, with a fictional mythical character of the very first king. This connection would, logically, exalt the monarch's lineage and himself as well, as the poem presents the nobility and the first king, in particular, to be the making and holding force behind the formation, guidance and preservation of human civilization itself. We will discuss this concept and many other points further as we make our way through the stanzas. Let's now look at a prose introduction to the poem. Quote, Many say in the old sagas that one of the Aesir, the god named Heimdall, went on a journey along a certain seashore, and soon he came to a farm where he gave his name as Rik. His poem is about that story. End quote. There are several things that need to be mentioned about this prose introduction. First off, it wasn't originally part of the poem. This introduction was actually added several centuries after this poem was composed. It was added by an annotator in presumably 14th or late 13th century, possibly for the, for the sake of cohesion, aiming to add a brief opening to the poem so anyone who would come across it afterwards wouldn't know what the poem was about. Now, this being said, a point has to be made that this annotator possibly wasn't all that familiar with Norse myths and folklore as he lists the god who goes by the name Rig in this poem as being the god Heimdall. This wouldn't be that big of a deal if there actually was something in the poem hinting towards the god Rik actually being Heimdall, which, however, is not the case. Not only is the identity of the god Rik never revealed, but what more, all of his characteristics and his overall mannerisms in this poem are far closer to the nature of Odin rather than Heimdall. We know that Odin would often venture among mortals under a disguise and a false name to influence them, and there, are, and there are many hints that this poem describes yet another of these cases. Another example of the annotator not being very familiar with Norse myths and characters is in the actual way he starts his edit introduction. Many say in the old sagas is a statement akin to such as legends tell or the old tales say, a statement not supported by any evidence other than the supposed age of the information that is somehow supposed to give it authentic value. And this is all the annotator gives us in a means of evidence for his claim that Rik is Heimdall. There are no citations or references to any of the old sagas or other poems in particular, and so you see why it is very hard for his claim to be believed. For example, even Snorri Sturluson, with his many additions and changes he made to the Norse myths to fit into his orderly picture of Norse mythology, even he still cited other poems as sources in his prose Edda. Well, sometimes. To be fair though, there are some mentions in other poems that could possibly link Heimdall with this poem. Most persuasive is the one in Voluspor. The Witch's Prophecy, which is the poem in which Volva, the seeress, reveals to Odin the prophecy of Ragnarok. Before she does it, however, she recounts tales of the past as well, among which she mentions this, which is also the opening to the poem itself. Quote, Heed my words, all classes of men, you greater and lesser children of Heimdall. You summoned me, Odin, to tell what I recall of the oldest deeds of gods and men. End quote. This, albeit vague and simple introduction, seems to suggest that Heimdall's formation of the social classes was a known concept to at the very least the author of this particular poem, though how well known and acknowledged concept it was overall in the Old Norse society is something we cannot know today. This supposed linking of Heimdall with the god Rik in the Riksflok poem still perplexes many scholars and experts to this day mainly because Rig's role in this story would fit Odin much better than Heimdall. Not only is Odin well known for influencing mortals by directly interfering in their affairs, but there was a known poetic concept in the Viking Age that is also utilized in this poem. You see, it was a common thing in these 
glorifying poems composed for various kings to link them as direct descendants of Odin, for example by having Odin have sex with their distant ancestors. This was basically the utmost recognition, for not only was the king for whom the poem was composed hailed as a descendant of a god, but of Odin no less. Odin, after all, is the archetype of a ruler. He is the king of kings, for he rules over all the gods in Asgard. He is wise, powerful and respected, and it is the utmost honor for any king to be praised as his descendant. As I said, there are many poems with similar motif, that is, portraying some king as a descendant of Odin, but there are none, at least to my knowledge, that would do the same with Heimdall, and for good reason. Yes, Heimdall is honorable, just and patient, which are attributes one would surely want in a ruler, however, he is still a mere sentry, a guardian who doesn't rule over anyone, unlike Odin. Even though there is no definitive consensus as to who the god Rig in this poem actually is, we will see as we go through this poem the many characteristics that point to the god Rig actually being Odin rather than Heimdall. In my video about Heimdall in my Journey Through Norse Mythology series, I covered this poem and I reimagined it in a way that fits both Odin and Heimdall. But you have to realize that my journey through Norse mythology series is foremost a story-driven narrative. Even though I always present to you the background to each topic and support my storytelling with evidence, the Norse myths weren't told with a coherent narrative in mind. They are individual stories composed and spread sometimes centuries apart in different regions of Scandinavia, and even though they share many common themes, they aren't supposed to really fit together into a overarching narrative or storyline. In my series Journey from Norse Mythology, I however try to do just that and tell a coherent narrative that captures the different tales of Norse myths into one big story that encompasses all that we know of Norse gods and their world. This means that I sometimes have to add and fill in the blanks when the stories are vague or lacking and even though I try to stick close to the evidence and spirit of Norse myths, I also have to balance it with the narrative I'm trying to build. What I'm basically trying to say here is that you shouldn't take my story interpretations as the absolute truth. Yes, they are largely built on true information, but they also contain many of my own additions which may or may not be true. However, whenever I will interpret a poem into a story, I will subsequently release a video examining the said poem and presenting it to you in its rawest form, just as I'm doing right now so you can actually see what the poem looks like compared to my story interpretation. This will hopefully let you reflect on my changes and additions and understand why they were implemented. And more importantly, you'll be able to make your own interpretation when you actually see the original poem and decide for yourself what you make of it. Even though I have the best interest of Norse myths at heart, I encourage you all to read, read and read. You should always seek out and read these stories for yourself and see what impression they leave on you. Well, with all that out of the way, let's delve into Rixfula and see what we can make of it. Quote, it is said that a wise god, Rig, powerful and aged, fierce and strong, walked upon green roads. End quote. Right from the first stanza, we are presented with a description of the god Rig that fits Odin much more than Heimdall. A wise, powerful and aged are the core characteristics of Odin, who is not only wise beyond measure, from his ever-continuous search and sacrifices he made for more knowledge, but also very powerful, thanks to the runic spells and incantations he learned when he hanged from Yggdrasil. Even a description as fierce and strong does fit Odin, for he is the god of war, and also the quote-unquote patron god of berserkers, the fiercest and most savage of warriors, who praised the Warfather in fanatic conviction to be granted the gift of the Berserker Rage, a combat trance during which they are filled with terrific strength and absent of all feeling of pain and fatigue. In reality though, the Berserkers just got psyched on some mushrooms. And of course, it is obvious that Odin would be described as aged, he is one of the oldest gods. He and his brothers were the ones who slew Ymir after all, and then built the very worlds that the Norse myths take place in. Quote, in the middle of the road he came walking. He came to a house. The door was open. He went in, 
A fire burned on the floor, and a grey-haired couple sat before it, named A and Edda. They were an aged pair. End quote. A and Edda are the first couple Rick visits on his journey. A and Edda are the poorest and most miserable of the three couples Rick visits, since they are supposed to represent the lowest class of the Old Norse society, the thralls, slaves, and later, the serfs. Given the translation of the names of the other two couples, which are grandfather and grandmother, and father and mother, it is presumed that these names could be translated as great-grandfather and great-grandmother. An important fact to mention here is that even though the, named, the name Edda is so well known thanks to, of course, the poetic and prose Edda, the actual meaning of the word is still a matter of debate and uncertainty. It was thanks to this poem that its meaning as great-grandmother was proposed, however, that is all it is, a suspected guess at its meaning. There are many other theories and propositions as to the word's true meaning, yet we still lack the decisive evidence to confirm any of them. Quote, Rick knew how to give them good counsel. He sat down between them, with man and the woman on either side of him. Then Edda took a sw swollen loaf of bread, heavy and thick, stuffed with grains, and she put that and more in the middle of the table. There was soup in a bowl, and boiled calf meat was set on the table. That was the best of their delicacies. End quote. After Rig gives the pair counsel, possibly about their role in society, they share with him their modest meal. This will repeat with each of the pairs Rig visits, and each pair will share with him a meal reflective of their social status. Uh, you might find this behavior strange, each pair letting a complete stranger stay under their roof and even sharing food with him, but in the Old Norse society, showing hospitality even to complete strangers was a common virtue. Quote, Rick rose from his seat and was ready for sleep. He knew how to give them good counsel. He lay down in bed between them, with the man and the woman on either side of him. He was there three nights in a row. Then he, was, he went walking in the middle of the road, and nine months soon passed. Edda had a child. They splashed him with water, wrapped him in dark clothes, and named him Slave. End quote. And now we see how Rig, by having sex with Edda, while he stayed at her and her husband's homestead, conceived a child that would give rise to the class of thralls the slave caste of the Old Norse society. Next we hear more about Slave's life and how he would become the progenitor of all the thralls. Quote, Slave grew up and did well for himself. His hands had scabby skin, knobby knuckles and fat fingers. His face was ugly, he had a bad back and a long pair of heels on his feet. Soon he got a chance to test his strength, he made rope, he made baskets. All day he carried firewood home. Then a woman came wandering his way with scars on her feet and sunburned arms. She had a hook nose and her name was Slave Woman. She sat down in the middle of the floor and Slave sat down next to her. They spoke and they whispered, Slave and Slave Woman, they were ready to bed after hard day's work. They had children, they taught them and loved them. I think their sons were named Lumpy and Barn Cleaner. Noisy and horsefly, sleeper, stinker, midget, fat boy, slow and grey hair, hunchback and dangleck. They made fences, they planted fields, they raised pigs, they herded goats, they shoveled manure. Their daughters were shorty and fatty, fat calf and beak nose, shriek and slave girl, gossip, skinny hips and bird legs. All the families of slaves are descended from them. End quote. Sowing the seeds of the future class of slaves, we next learn of where else Rig went upon his journey. Quote, Rig went upon his way. He came to a hall. The door was open. He went inside. A fire burned on the floor. A couple sat there, busy with their work. The man was busy with wood carving. His beard was trimmed. His hair lay in locks on his forehead. His shirt was tailored. He owned a chest of drawers. His wife sat and spun her spinning wheel. With her arms, she was weaving. She had a headdress, she wore a blouse. She had a lace choker and jeweled brooches. Effie and Amma were their names. End quote. 
Stanzas 14 to 16 show us the second couple Rig visits on his journey. Afi and Amma, or grandmother and grandfather, are the couple representing the middle class. In stanzas 15 and 16, we can see that their lifestyle and material possessions exceed that of the previous couple. They are busy with their crafts, they are groomed, and they own fine clothes, jewelry, and furniture, all pointing to their better status within society. From this point, the same course of events takes place as it did with the previous couple. Quote, Rig knew how to give them good counsel. He rose from the table, ready to sleep. He lay down in bed between them, with the man and the woman on either side of him. He was there three nights in a row, and nine months soon passed. Amma had a child, they splashed him with water, and named him Freeman. His mother wrapped her red-haired ruddy child in cloth, his eyes were keen. End quote. Sprinkling a newborn with water was a custom in the Old Norse society that existed far longer before the concept of baptism was brought to Scandinavia along with Christianity. Furthermore, we learned that Amma gave birth to a child which they named Freeman, and in the next several stanzas we see that he would become the progenitor of the middle class, the commoners, the farmers, and the craftsmen. Quote, he grew up and did well for himself. He tamed oxen, he made a plow, he built houses, and he built barns, he made wagons, and drove a plow. Then they brought him a housewife with her keys, in a goat-skin clothes, and married her to free man. She was named in-law, she wore the bridal veil, that couple lived together, they exchanged rings, they shared their sheets, and they made home. They had children, they taught them, and loved them. Their sons were manful and fighter, brave, swordsman and smith, stout, farmer, trim-beard, rancher, and husband, sharp-beard and manly. And they had daughters with these names, smart, bride, swan, lady, dame, girl, noblewoman, wife, shy and vivacious. All the families of free farmers are descended from them. With the classes of free men successfully originated, Rig continued along his journey. Quote, Rig went on upon his way. He came to a hall with the door facing south and standing open. There was a ring for knocking on the door. He went in and found the floor covered with straw. A husband and wife sat there and looked in one another's eyes. They were named father and mother. They held one another's hand. The husband sat and strung his bow. He bent its shaft and made arrows for it. His wife inspected the sleeves of her blues, stroked the wrinkles out, smoothened them out. She adjusted her headdress. She had a jewel on her chest, a long dress and a blue-colored blues. Her face was more beautiful. Her breast was more beautiful. Her neck was more beautiful than pure snow. End quote. The last couple of rig visits represents the upper class, which is the warrior caste, but also the nobility, and later also the monarchy. The husband of the pair, named Father, is making arrows for his bow, possibly symbolizing this role is to deal with the matters of war. The events that take place next are identical to that of the previous two couples. Quote, Rick knew how to give them good counsel. He sat down between them, with a the man and a woman on either side of him. Then mother brought out a fine white ornamental cloth and covered the table. She brought out thin sliced bread made of white wheat and filled the table. She set out full plates and treasures of silver on the table, loaded with meat and poultry. They drank wine from gemstone beakers. They drank and talked till the day turned into night. Rick knew how to give them good counsel. He rose from his seat and prepared the bed. He was there three nights in a row. Then he went walking again in the middle of the road, and nine months soon passed. Mother had a child. She swaddled him in silk. They sprinkled water over him and named him Lord. His hair was blonde, his cheeks were bright, his eyes were as cruel and clear as vipers. They raised Lord there in their home. He learned to hold a shield, to string a bow, to bend a bow, to carve an arrow, to throw a spear, to cast a javelin to ride a horse, to hunt with dogs, to draw a sword, to swim competitively." Here we can see that lords or 
Earl's upbringing is much different from the children of the other two couples. Unlike them, he doesn't learn a craft or walks the fields, no, he learns the ways of a warrior, and the god Rig makes use of his talents when he returns to his parents' homestead. Quote, then Rig came walking to their farm. He taught Lord Runes, gave him his own name, called him his son, told him to claim lands, to conquer lands, conquer old villages. End quote. In this stanza, we find several points that hint at Rig actually being Odin. Rig teaches Lord Runes, which is something that fits quite well with Odin, but he also bids him to take up arms and wage war. An action very reminiscent of Odin, who provokes wars between mortals on many occasions in the myths. Behavior like this isn't something that would remind us of Heimdall we know from the myths, who is honorable and just. Another thing I realized just recently upon several re-readings and comparisons to the other translations is the meaning of the fifth line. When I first read it, I falsely presumed that its meaning was that Rik revealed his true name and identity to Lord, but when I compared it with the other translations, I found that its true meaning is actually that Rik passed his name onto Lord as a sort of a title. Rik in translation means king, yet another reason to think Rig is Odin by the way. And so Rig giving his name to Lord is most likely an acknowledgement that he deserves the title, for he mastered all that Rig taught him. In the original Old Norse, in the following stanzas, Lord is then called Rick Earl. Quote, he rode then through the icy mountains of Mirkwood, till he came to a hall and shook his spear, shook his shield, set his horse to a gallop, and drew his sword. He started a war, he reddened the fields with blood, he killed many men, he conquered many lands. He became a sole owner of eighteen estates, he shared his wealth, he gave his men treasures upon treasures, and good horses, he gave away rings. He did not care to hold them." End quote. These two stanzas tell us about Lord's exploits that reflect the brutal yet renowned way of life in Scandinavia during the Viking Age, winning lands, riches and glory through conquest. Yet another reason why to believe Rig to be Odin, since his desire for war is ever present. If Rig truly is Odin, then perhaps through his guidance he hoped to sow the seeds of this warlike way of life into the hearts of mortals, making it the status quo of the whole society. This would make the concept of war and conflict commonplace among mortals, suiting Odin's needs and intentions. We have to realize that the warlike way of life of the Norsemen that may seem brutal and fierce to us today was widely accepted and encouraged in Scandinavia during the Viking Age. Strength and power was praised and shows of force, such as wars, were honored greatly if successful. Let's continue with the following stanzas. Quote, then messengers came along well-prepared roads. They came to the hall where the chieftain lived. They presented the beautiful, soft-fingered wise girl whose name was Eagle. They offered Lord the girl, took her to his home, married her to him. She wore the bridal veil. Then they lived together and loved one another. They increased their family and enjoyed their days. Their oldest son was boy, and the next was kid, then offspring and noble, heir and scion, descendant and successor, son and lad, another nobility, and the youngest was named king. They played together, they learned to swim, to play chess. The sons of Lord grew up there, they broke horses, they made shields, they shot arrows, they made From these stanzas, we learn of Lord's wedding, the name of his sons, though interestingly, no list of his daughters is presented, and we also learn of his most important son, the young king, who is very much unlike his brothers. While all his brothers spend their days just learning the ways of a warrior and waging war, the young king learns other skills. Quote, but young king learned runes, runes of fate and runes of destiny. He learned spells to save lives and dull blades, to calm storms. He learned the language of birds. He learned to put out fires, to calm sorrows and induce sleep, and give comfort in sorrow. He had the strength, the passion of eight men." Quote. While his brothers learned how to wage war, 
young king learned the runes and runic charms of various powers. Most of which here mentioned are the actual runic spells Odin learned when he hanged from Yggdrasil. Yet another thing that lends credence to the theory that the Rig might be Odin, since we learn in the next stanza that it was actually young king's father, Lord, who taught him the runes, and since he learned them from the god Rig, it seems very likely that the god Rig is in fact Odin. Quote, Rig shared runes with him, but king tricked him and learned them better than he, and then he earned the right to call himself by the name of Rig for his rune, rune law. End quote. In this stanza, we learn that Lord Rig, in the original Old Norse Rig Ur, who is Young King's father, shared with his son the runecraft the god Rig taught him. However, Young King tricked his father, and after he gained all the knowledge his father could teach him, he revealed that he mastered the runic spells better than he, and he had in turn earned the title of Rig. In my storytelling interpretation, I falsely interpreted this stanza as the god Rig returning to teach young king just as he taught his father, but now that I compare this translation with a few others, I can safely say I was wrong in that assumption, and the Rig in this stanza is meant to be young king's father, and the purpose of this stanza is to show the young king exceeded his father in his mastery of rune law. Alas, we come to the final three stanzas of the poem, which is unfortunately incomplete. And even though we can guess at what ending it was aiming at, it is still a shame the poem didn't survive in its entirety. Quote, Young king rode with his arrows, he shot arrows, he killed birds. Then a crow said to him, a crow sitting on a high branch, Why do you kill birds, young king? It would be better to mount upon your horse and kill men. I know two chieftains with rich horses, they live nearby. They have bigger inheritances than you have. They know how to steer ships, they know how to sharpen blades, they know how to kill men." End quote. In these last few stanzas, we can see a scene of a crow talking to young king, tempting him into attacking his neighbors. This isn't something totally ridiculous, as birds often play the role of mentors in Old Norse literature, and as we've read in stanza 42, young king learned the language of birds. These last three stanzas seem to suggest that the crow tempts the young king, who is out on a hunt, to instead wage war under the pretense of gaining wealth and glory from defeating his more powerful neighbors. This will most likely lead to young king waging many wars and winning plenty of renown and wealth and forging his own kingdom. The poem would most likely end with the poet talking about how the king this poem was composed in honor of is a great descendant of the young king, and therefore a descendant of the god Rig, who may or may not be Odin as well. In the end, we cannot conclude decisively who the god Rig actually is, but I hope this examination gave you a good idea why there is so much indecision about this poem, and hopefully this gave you a base of comparison when you look back to my story interpretation in my Journey Through Norse Mythology series. I will see you all next time. I do a story interpretation of a poem from the Poetic Edda, but this would be all for today, and I bid you all farewell, until next time.